Chapter 16 of Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of Poor Boys Who Became Famous by Sarah Knowles Bolton. William Lloyd Garrison. For a great work, God raises up a great man. Usually, he is trained in the hard school of poverty to give him courage and perseverance. Usually, he stands alone among a great multitude that he may have firmness and endurance. William Lloyd Garrison was born to be preeminently the deliverer of the slave. For 200 years, the curse of African slavery had rested upon one of the fairest portions of our land. Everybody thought it an evil to keep four million human beings from even the knowledge of how to read and write, and a cruelty to sell children away from parents, to toil forever without home or kindred. Everybody knew that slavery was as ruinous almost to master as to slave, that labor was thereby despised, and that luxury was sapping the vigor of a race. But every slave meant money, and money is very dear to mankind. Before the Declaration of Independence, 300,000 slaves had been brought to this country, some of the colonists remonstrated, but the traffic was not stopped till 1808. The Quakers were opposed to human bondage from the first, and decided in 1780 to free all their slaves. Vermont had freed hers three years previously, and other northern states soon followed. Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and others were outspoken against the sin, but it continued to increase till, in 1810, we had over a million slaves. Five years before this time, in a plain wooden house in Newburyport, Massachusetts, a boy was born who was to electrify America, and the world even, on this great subject. William Lloyd Garrison's father was a sea captain, a man who loved books and had some literary ambition. The mother was a noble woman, deeply religious, willing to bear all and brave all for conscience' sake, and fearless in the path of duty. She early taught her boy to hate oppression of every kind and to stand everywhere for the right. Very poor, there was no chance for William, either in school or college. When he was seven, his mother, having found work for herself as a nurse for the sick, placed the child with a deacon of the town, where he learned to split wood and other useful things. At nine, the careful mother put him to the shoemaking trade, though he was scarcely large enough to hold the lapstone. He was not happy here, longing for something that made him think. Perhaps he would like to build tables and chairs better, so he was apprenticed to a cabinet maker. But here he was no more satisfied than with the monotony of sewing leather. At his own request, the dealer canceled the agreement, and the boy found a place to set type on the Newburyport Herald. At last he had obtained the work he loved. He would someday own a paper, he thought, and write articles for it. Ah, how often poor boys, and rich, build air castles which tumble to the ground. It is well that we build them, for life soon becomes prosaic enough to the happiest of us. At sixteen he wrote an article for the Herald, signing it, an old bachelor. Imagine his surprise and delight when he saw it really in print. Meantime, his mother, 
who was six hundred miles away, wrote him devoted letters, ever encouraging and stimulating him to be upright and temperate. A year later she died, and William was left to fight his battles alone. He missed the letters, missed having someone to whom he could tell a boy's hopes and fears and temptations. That boy is especially blessed who has a mother to whom he can confide everything. Such a boy usually has a splendid future because by her wisdom and advice he becomes well fitted for life, making no foolish experiments. Reading as much as possible, at 19 William wrote some political articles for a Salem paper, and, strange to say, they were attributed to Honorable Timothy Pickering. Surely he could do something in the world now. So when his apprenticeship was over and he had worked long and faithfully, he started a paper for himself. He called it The Free Press. It was a good title and a good paper, but like most first literary adventures, it proved a failure. Perhaps he ought to have foreseen that one can do little without capital. But youth is about as blind as love, and rarely stops to reason. Did one failure discourage him? Oh no. He went to Boston and found a place in a printing office. He soon became the editor of The National Philanthropist, the first paper established to advocate total abstinence from intoxicants. His motto was a true one, not very popular, however, in those days. Quote, Moderate drinking is the downhill road to drunkenness. End quote. He was now 22, poor, but God-fearing and self-reliant. About this time there came to Boston a man whose influence changed young Garrison's whole life, Benjamin Lundy, a Quaker, 39 years of age. Leaving his father's home at 19, he had spent four years at Wheeling, Virginia, where he learned the saddler's trade, and learned also the cruelties of slaveholding. After this, he moved to Ohio, and in four years earned $3,000 above his living expenses. When he was 26, he organized an anti-slavery society at his own house, and, promising to become assistant editor of an abolition paper, he went to St. Louis to dispose of his stock of saddlery. Business was greatly depressed, the whole region being agitated over the admission of Missouri as a slave state. And, after spending two years, Lundy returned to Ohio on foot in winter, his property entirely gone. None of his ardor for freedom having abated, he determined to start a monthly paper, though poor and entirely ignorant about printing. This sheet he called the genius of universal emancipation. Printed 20 miles from his home, the edition being carried on his back each month as he walked the long distance. He moved shortly after to East Tennessee, walking half of the 800 miles, and gradually increased his subscription list. Several times his life was in danger, but the slight, gentle Quaker kept quietly on his course. In 1824, he set out on foot for Baltimore, paying his way by saddlery or harness mending, living on the poorest fare, and he subsequently established the genius there. While he was absent from home, his wife died, leaving twins, and his five children were divided among friends. Deeply sorrowing, he renewed his resolve to devote his life to worse than motherless children, those sold into bondage, and made his way as best he could to Boston. Of such material were the foundation stones of the anti-slavery cause. At his boarding place, 
Lundy met Garrison and told him his burning desire to rid the country of slavery. The heart of the young printer was deeply moved. He too was poor and unknown, but he had not forgotten his mother's teachings and prayers. After some time, he agreed to go to Baltimore and help edit The Genius of Universal Emancipation. Lundy was in favor of sending the slaves to the West Indies or Africa as fast as their masters would consent to free them, which was not very fast. Garrison said, The slaves are here by no fault of their own and do not deserve to be sent back to barbarous Africa. He was in favor of immediate freedom for every human being. Baltimore had slave pens on the principal streets. Vessel loads of slaves, torn from their homes, were sent hundreds of miles away to southern ports, and the auction block often witnessed heart-rending scenes. The tender heart of Garrison was stirred to its very depths. In the first issue of his paper, he declared for immediate emancipation and soon denounced the slave trade between Baltimore and New Orleans as domestic piracy, giving the names of several citizens engaged in the traffic, among them a vessel owner from his own town, Newburyport. The northern man immediately arrested Garrison for gross and malicious libel, and he was found guilty by a slaveholding court and fined fifty dollars and costs. No one was ready to give bail, and he was thrown into prison. The young man was not in the least cast down, but, calm and heroic, wrote two sonnets on the walls of his cell. Meantime, a noble young Quaker at the North, John G. Whittier, was deeply anxious for Garrison. He had no money to pay his fine, but, greatly admiring Henry Clay, whom he hoped to see president, wrote him urging that he aid the guiltless prisoner. Clay would doubtless have done so, but Arthur Tappan, one of New York's noble men, sent the money, releasing Garrison from his 49 days imprisonment. Wendell Phillips says of him, he was in jail for his opinions when he was just 24. He had confronted a nation in the very bloom of his youth. Garrison had not been idle while in prison. He had prepared several lectures on slavery, and these he now gave when he could find a hearing. Large churches were not opened to him, and nobody offered him $200 a night. The free colored people welcomed him gladly, but the whites were usually indifferent or opposed to such fanatical ideas. At last he came to Boston to start a paper, that city where brains, not wealth, opened the doors to the best society. Here, with no money nor influential friends, he started The Liberator, with this for his motto, quote, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to speak or write with moderation. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. End quote. The North was bound hand and foot by the slave trade almost as effectually as the South. The great plea was the fear lest the Union would be dissolved. Cotton factories had sprung up on every hand, and it was believed that slave labor was essential to the producing of cotton. Some thought it would not be safe to free the slaves that assassinations would be the result. The real secret, however, was that each slave meant several hundred dollars, 
and freedom meant poverty to the masters. Meantime, the liberator was making itself felt, despite Garrison's poverty. The Vigilance Association of South Carolina offered a reward of $1,500 for the apprehension and prosecution of any white person who might be detected in distributing or circulating it. In Raleigh, North Carolina, the grand jury found a bill against the young editor, hoping to bring him to that state for trial. Honorable Robert Y. Hain of South Carolina, having received a paper by mail, wrote to Harrison Gray Otis, mayor of Boston, to ascertain the sender. Mr. Otis caused an agent to visit the office of the Liberator and returned answer to Mr. Hain that he found it an obscure hole, his only visible auxiliary a Negro boy, and his supporters a few very insignificant persons of all colors. And where was this obscure hole? In the third story of a business block, the walls dingy, says Mr. Oliver Johnson in Garrison and His Times, the small windows bespattered with printer's ink, the press standing in one corner, the long editorial and mailing table covered with newspapers, the bed of the editor and publisher on the floor, all these make a picture never to be forgotten. Their food, what little they had, was procured at a neighboring bakery. Soon, Georgia passed a law offering $5,000 to any person arresting and bringing to trial under the laws of the state and punishing to conviction the editor or publisher of the Liberator. What a wonder that some ruffian at midnight did not break into the obscure hole and drag the young man off to a slave vessel lying close by in the harbor. The leaven of anti-slavery was beginning to work. Twelve fanatics gathered one stormy night in the basement of an African church in Boston and organized the New England Anti-Slavery Society in 1832. The following year, as the managers of the American Colonization Society had sent an agent to England, it was deemed best to send Garrison abroad to tell Wilberforce and others who were working for the suppression of slavery in the West Indies that it was not a wise plan to send the slaves to Africa. It was difficult to raise the money needed, but self-sacrifice usually leaves a good bank account. The fanatic, only 28, was received with open arms by such men as Lord Brougham, Wilberforce, Clarkson, and Daniel O'Connell. Sir Thomas Fowell Buxton gave a breakfast in his honor. When the guests had arrived, among them Mr. Garrison, Mr. Buxton held up both hands, exclaiming, Why, my dear sir, I thought you were a black man. This, Mr. Garrison used to say, was the greatest compliment of his life, because it showed how truly and heartily he had labored for the slave. A great meeting was arranged for him at Exeter Hall, London. How inspiring all this for the young reformer. Here he met the eloquent George Thompson and asked him to visit our country, which invitation he accepted. On his return, the American Anti-Slavery Society was formed. December 4, 1833, at Philadelphia, delegates coming from 11 states. John G. Whittier was chosen secretary. The noble poet has often said that he was more proud that his name should appear signed to the Declaration of Principles adopted at that meeting than on the title page of any of his volumes. Thus has he ever loved liberty.
The contest over the slavery question was growing extremely bitter. Prudence Crandall of Canterbury, Connecticut, a young Quaker lady, admitted several colored girls to her school, who came from Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. The people were indignant at such a commingling of races. Shopkeepers refused to sell her anything. Her well was filled with refuse, and at last her house was nearly torn down by a midnight mob. Lane Theological Seminary, Cincinnati, Western Reserve College, Hudson, Ohio, with some others, were nearly broken up by the conflict of opinion. Some anti-slavery lecturers were tarred and feathered or thrown into prison. In New York, a pro-slavery mob broke in the doors and windows of a Presbyterian church and laid waste schoolhouses and dwellings of colored people. In Philadelphia, the riots lasted three days, 44 houses of colored people being nearly or quite destroyed. In Boston, a most respectable mob composed, says Horace Greeley, in good part of merchants, dispersed a company of women belonging to the Female Anti-Slavery Society while its president was engaged in prayer. Learning that Garrison was in the adjoining office, they shouted, We must have Garrison! Out with him! Lynch him! Attempting to escape by the advice of the mayor, who was present, he sought refuge in a carpenter's shop, but the crowd drew him out and, coiling a rope around his body, dragged him bareheaded along the street. One man called out, He shan't be hurt, he is an American, and this probably saved his life, though many blows were aimed at his head and his clothes were nearly torn from his body. The mayor, declaring that he could only be saved by being lodged in jail, Garrison pressed into a hack and was driven as rapidly as possible to the prison, the maddened crowd clinging to the wheels, dashing against the doors, and seizing hold of the horses. At last he was behind the bars and out of their reach. On the walls of his cell he wrote, quote, William Lloyd Garrison was put into this cell on Wednesday afternoon, October 21st, 1835, to save him from the violence of a respectable and influential mob who sought to destroy him for preaching the abominable and dangerous doctrine that all men are created equal and that all oppression is odious in the sight of God. Confine me as a prisoner, but bind me not as a slave. Punish me as a criminal, but hold me not as a chattel. Torture me as a man, but drive me not like a beast. Doubt my sanity, but acknowledge my immortality." End quote. The respectable mob had wrought wiser than they knew. Garrison and his liberator became more widely known than ever. Famous men and women now joined the despised abolitionists. The conflict was growing deeper. Elijah P. Lovejoy, the ardent young preacher of Alton, Illinois, was murdered by four balls at the hands of a pro-slavery mob who broke up his printing press and threw it into the river. A public meeting was held in Faneuil Hall to condemn such an outrage. A prominent man in the gallery, having risen to declare that Lovejoy died as the fool dieth, a young man, unknown to most, stepped to the rostrum and spoke as though inspired. From that day, Wendell Phillips was the orator of America. From that day, the anti-slavery cause had a new consecration. From this time till 1860, the struggle between freedom and slavery 
was continuous. The South needed the territories for her rapid increase of slaves. The North was opposed, but in the year 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, devised by Stephen A. Douglas, repealed the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had prohibited slavery north of latitude 36 degrees 30 minutes, the southern boundary of Kansas. Kansas at once became a battleground. Armed men came over from Missouri to establish slavery. Men came from New England determined that the soil should be free if they spilled their blood to gain it. The Fugitive Slave Law, whereby slaves were returned without trial by jury and slave owners allowed to search the North for their slaves, made great bitterness. The brutal attack of Preston Brooks of South Carolina on Charles Sumner for his speech on Kansas and the hanging of John Brown by the state of Virginia for his invasion of Harper's Ferry with 17 white men and five Negroes, calling upon the slaves to rise and demand their liberty, brought matters to a crisis. Garrison was opposed to war, but after the firing on Sumter, April 12, 1861, it was inevitable. For two years after Abraham Lincoln's election to the presidency, Garrison waited impatiently for that pen stroke which set four million human beings free. When the Emancipation Proclamation was issued January 1, 1863, Garrison's life work was accomplished. Thirty-five years of untiring, heroic struggle had not been in vain. When, two years later, the Stars and Stripes were raised again over Fort Sumter, he was invited by President Lincoln as a guest of the government to witness the imposing scene. When Mr. Garrison arrived in Charleston, the colored people were nearly wild with joy. Children sang and men shouted. A slave made an address of welcome, his two daughters bearing a wreath of flowers to their great benefactor. Garrison's heart was full to overflowing as he replied, quote, Not unto us, not unto us, but unto God be all the glory for what has been done in regard to your emancipation. Thank God this day that you are free, and be resolved that, once free, you will be free forever. Liberty or death, but never slavery. While God gives me reason and strength, I shall demand for you everything I claim for the whitest of the white in this country." End quote. The same year he discontinued the publication of The Liberator, putting in type with his own hands the official ratification of the 13th Amendment, forever prohibiting slavery in the United States, and adding, quote, Hail, redeemed, regenerated America! Hail, all nations, tribes, kindred and peoples, made of one blood, interested in a common redemption, heirs of the same immortal destiny. Hail, angels in glory, tune your harps anew, singing, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty." End quote. Two years after the war, Mr. Garrison crossed the ocean for the fourth time. He was no longer the poor lad setting type at 13, or sleeping on the hard floor of a printing room, or lying in a Baltimore jail, or the victim of a Boston mob. He was the center of a grand and famous circle. The Duke and Duchess of Argyle and the Duchess of Sutherland paid him special honors. John Bright presided at a public breakfast given him at St. James Hall, London. Such men as John Stuart Mill, Herbert Spencer, and Professor Huxley 
graced the feast. Mr. Bright said in his opening address concerning Mr. Garrison, quote, His is the creation of that opinion which has made slavery hateful and which has made freedom possible in America. His name is venerated in his own country, venerated in this country and in Europe. Wheresoever Christianity softens the hearts and lessens the sorrows of men. End quote. Edinburgh conferred upon him the freedom of the city, an honor accorded to one other American only, George Peabody. Birmingham, Manchester, and other cities held great public meetings to do him reverence. On his return, such friends as Sumner, Wilson, Emerson, Longfellow, Lowell, Greeley, and others presented him with $30,000. The remainder of his life he devoted to temperance, woman suffrage, and every other reform calculated to make the world better. His true character was shown when, years before, appointed to the London Anti-Slavery Convention as a delegate, he refused to take his seat after his long journey across the ocean because such noble co-workers as Lucretia Mott, Mrs. Wendell Phillips, and others were denied their place as delegates. Thus strenuous was he for right and justice to all. Always modest, hopeful, and cheerful, he was as gentle in private life with his wife and five children as he was strong and fearless in his public career. He died at the home of his daughter in New York, May 24, 1879, his children singing about his bed at his request. Awake, my soul, stretch every nerve, and rise, my soul, and stretch thy wings. At sunset, in forest hills, they laid the brave man to rest, a quartet of colored singers around his open grave, singing, I cannot always trace the way. The storm and peril overpassed, the hounding hatred shamed and still, go, soul of freedom, take at last the place which thou alone canst fill. Confirm the lesson taught of old. Life saved for self is lost, while they who lose it in his service hold the lease of God's eternal day. End of chapter 16. Recording by Lucretia B.